Today I'm making a video finally supporting the notion that the SARS-CoV-2 virus, when it's infect us, it might be getting inside bacteria because we're going to be talking about a paper that showed that antibiotic treatment helped people who were infected with faster resolution of their COVID-19 symptoms. My name is Dr. Mikhail Vashik from Our Genomics. Let's get started on this. And remember I made a video before showing a suggestion coming out from this one group of scientists claiming that, look, it looks, it really appears that the virus, SARS-CoV-2, not only can it infect our cells, but is also infecting bacteria and in that in itself might contribute to the disease itself, how its presentation, including, they think my including might be also be influencing long COVID afterwards. And uh, there has been a little bit of a literature showing how antibiotics might have been used to help during COVID-19, as well as um, potentially with uh, helping people who were intubated as well. And uh, these authors basically look at old evidence of uh, RNA viruses and what, what antibiotics have been used in the past to treat a whole bunch of patients, as it was more than 200 people, I think, that were treated with a variety of different, different um, antibiotics. They mentioned, I think, like at least five different antibiotics that, were treat that these patients were treated with. The most common one, I think, was azithromycin, and another one was, I think it was amoxicillin, and there was one more that they used Refu Maxin, something I can't remember. These uh, these names they're so bizarre for me. And either way, that one they used only if the patients did not manage to go on antibiotic antibiotic treatment within three days post infection. And the key here was how rapidly these antibiotics were used. So again, I reviewed this before how the bacteria might be infected by the virus. And these authors are saying, look, right now the main the main idea, the main concept is that virus is infecting us and it's then infecting our cells, right? Our epithelial cells. But what we're forgetting is that there would be a layer of bacteria between the virus and our own cells that the virus would have to get through and cope with. And there's evidence showing that viruses do get inside these bacteria, bacteria they do replicate in them and they um, can break these bacteria apart and they also get to be mutated as the viruses are made inside bacteria. So it's kind of like whatever the variant you might inhale it, inhale it, might not be the variant that eventually actually attacks your own cells, the actual epithelial cells in, inside your body because it could be mutated in the process of getting through the bacteria. And I'll just I read another review by these authors and um, I'm going to show you a couple more images showing because they're, they're probably some of my favorite images in that latest review that I read showing how bacteria using electron microscopy. So this is probably the closest we can get currently in science of actually getting images of viruses themselves and you can actually see how there's bacteria that are infected by SARS-CoV-2 virus. Literally, you can see all these tiny little circles inside bacteria, and you can see also bacterial walls being bro broken down by the virus. So the virus is labeled with all the black arrows. One of them is also circled with, with like a red marker, and then where the bacterial walls are being broken down by the virus so the virus can be released was was marked with um, colored arrows. And so that's one of the coolest images. And then there's another one, another way, there's numerous different ways of how you can track whether there is virus infection. Check out the previous video to find out. Another way, way is with antibodies and you can label antibodies with miniature amount, amount of gold. And then you can determine where the gold is present in your image. You can, you can zap it with specific like a wavelength, and then you'll be able to see where the gold is, like a black, by a, like a black picture. And, and they showed an image of antibodies targeting the nucleocapsid protein of SARS-CoV-2 virus. And it showed that there's bacteria that show 
little black dots inside of them that would be that showing you where the nucleocapsid protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus is and so what's neat is that in that image is that they also show that there's a, a eukaryotic cell present basically a yeast cell so you can see this giant cell in comparison to the bacteria that are, that are all around and so clearly there's a very very convincing evidence that SARS-CoV-2 indeed goes through the bacterial layer and the authors are suggesting because of this something like and because of the, the bacteria itself imposes own type of mutagenesis on on the virus there this might be for example a reason why vaccines could uh, be waning more rapidly than one would expect this could also be why some of the um, antivirals might not work properly and the reason why is because the antivirals are supposed to work for preventing for example virus entering our own mammalian cells but they might not correspond what's happening with what what the bacteria will do to to the virus kind of life cycle in between and antibiotics is then then a possibility to use and that's what the authors wanted to to study because the idea would be look the the virus is when it gets inside the bacteria it can of course will break bunch of kill bunch of bacteria so it can lead to this biosis right that's problem number one this is what we're seeing with COVID-19 or can be seen with COVID-19 infection as well then what happens is as you the bacteria release break, break break down and release the virus virus itself via the spike protein can then start damaging endothelial cells so those are the cells that are used for building up building your blood vessels but also bacteria themselves can release a bunch of molecules that themselves can also target the endothelial cells as well and damage the blood networks and as a consequence that speeds up the clotting process so this is now a multiple ways of how spike protein directly and indirectly could be causing microclots so directly i remember i did a big series showing how spike protein could be involved in causing microclots directly. I also showed you a video where spike protein could be inducing certain antibodies um, that could contribute autoantibodies that could be contributing to the formation of clots. Here is another example. Spike protein could be indirectly causing clots because of its influence on the bacteria and then bacteria promoting clot formation via its, its uh, chemical compounds that it could be releasing right so and the reason why why when that happens is when you make these clot formations that might be one of the ways of how you could reduce the ability of a person to be able to breathe and have a reduced oxygen intake for example right and the reason why i mention that is because it will become apparent when i discuss this st study so basically they they treat a bunch of everyone in the study was treated with antibiotics and the only difference is some of them vaccinated some of them were unvaccinated and basically the only difference is when people were treated with antibiotics so some of them some of the individuals were treated within three days post-infection and some individuals were treated later than that and and the differences were being scored all of these individuals got sick between october 2020 to 2022 so that's when the data was was collected and it was very interesting so for example the average duration of sickness for these individuals was seven days there was no difference between vaccinated versus unvaccinated so that was interesting so they both both of these groups were about sick for seven days as well the first difference that they mentioned that was interesting is which variant you might have been infected might have influenced your illness uh, duration. So, for example, those who were infected with the Delta variant were sicker for eight days versus those who were infected with the Omicron variant were only sick for six and a half days. Huh? All right, I think that's going to stay there. <laughs> yeah. And um, the other difference was... Uh, those who had comorbidities, they were, for example, six for eight days in comparison to the average seven days. And um, the, I think, biggest noted difference that they mentioned, though, is those who took the antibiotics. So if you took the antibiotic within three days of infection, 
you were sick for seven days, but if you took the antibiotics as a treatment later than three days, then duration of your illness skyrocketed and, and it actually ended up being something like 11 and a half days. So huge difference. It was almost five fold uh, it has increased hazard ratio, ratio for more severe sickness if you took antibiotics later than within then the first three days post, um, post um, infection. The one thing that I found was really disappointing though is that the authors really didn't start differentiating any of the data in terms of how did the different antibiotics used in, in this publication work. They really didn't get into any details on, on that account. And I was really surprised about that because as I mentioned, in the article, there's at least five different antibiotics being mentioned that, that, were, that were used. Some combinations are mentioned in terms of specific amounts. Some of these, I didn't even see any amounts being mentioned. And then the data does, is not, does not differentiate any effect between antibiotics combinations themselves. And that would have been really interesting to, to know this. So perhaps this is coming up in a, in a later edition of further pu publication as well but basically this is the take-home message but there's something else that was the primary outcome that they wanted to see is basically could antibiotics reduce the the time span bef uh, of uh, when you basically stop showing your sickness symptoms after SARS-CoV-2 virus infection but they also looked at long COVID as well the likelihood of long COVID development post uh, antibiotic use one way or another, about 10% of these individuals ended up developing long COVID. And the authors were mentioning that, that um, the early treatment of antibiotic use might help against long COVID. At least that's how I understood it, but that's not what I really saw in, uh, in terms of data really showing this. One more thing that they mentioned that was supposedly shown in supplementary data that I was not able to um, basically uh, get hold of was um, that those who took the antibiotics later they were also more likely to develop pneumonia and it also didn't matter whether you were vaccinated or unvaccinated but I couldn't open that data so I did, can, couldn't verify it couldn't, couldn't tell you anything about it okay so there's that and but the one that I found super interesting is they also looked at blood oxygen I think saturation is what they called it I hope I got that right but the point is is basically how much oxygen your blood would carry and they, the difference they saw was actually quite phenomenal those who took the antibiotic early early antibiotic treatment they showed basically um, more than 95 percent um, oxygen saturation of the blood cells and those who took antibiotics later than that their blood oxygen saturation dropped to 92 point something as well so big difference so this is why hence possibly those microclots might the other side might have been contributing to that drop uh, in in the blood oxygenation so i thought that was that was really really neat finding as well wasn't their their primary uh, information that they were looking for but they did measure that and and that that's something that um, looked really, really positive. So first data showing that indeed, perhaps antibiotics are crucial in proper treatment of, of COVID and it's an early use of antibiotics in, in early in, in, the, in the disease development. So super interesting. So we'll see how that information expands further. I can also tell you that one of the leading authors behind this theory and these studies is someone that I had a chance to now recently collaborate with on, on a review as well, precisely on this topic as well. So now I get to, I've, I actually got convinced fairly, fairly early on based on this data and uh, recently I had an opportunity to start working together on a review discussing this further. So this is very, very fascinating to me. And, and uh, I think, we might potentially down the road start looking at this from the perspective of, hey, this virus has to deal with not just our own mammalian cells, but also the bacterial cells, which far outnumber 
of course our own cells so then it makes sense that when the virus first comes into contact with us it might be encountering bacterial layer first and that might have its own influence and remember in the previous video i mentioned that when these bacterial cells break down as well and release their own compounds these compounds might add add to the toxicity that is being experienced in the infection and potentially long COVID. All right, I'm going to wrap it up right here. That's all I have for you today. Please give us a like. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Please leave us a comment. Give us your thoughts as well. And um, as always, oh, and please check out the Patreon account as well, which is where we post additional type of videos that do not make it to YouTube. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.